How important is specialization for artificial intelligence and deep learning? Find out in this video. Now, as is often the case with these questions, it really depends on what your career goals and aspirations are. If you are hoping to go to work for global mega corporation, that will have one set of conditions versus being an academic researcher versus being a successful startup founder. Let's take each of these in turn and see what type of skill sets you're gonna need in each. So to be a successful engineer at global mega corporation, you're probably gonna be coming right from undergrad, if not perhaps a master's or heaven forbid a PhD program, uh, in which case you're gonna have um, increasing levels of specialization. So that means that as an undergrad, you're gonna be the most generalized. Then as a graduate student, you're gonna have a uh, higher level of specialization in one topic and pretty much one topic only, but of course with a strong foundation in the fundamentals as I covered in my previous video on should you go to graduate school. So once you get the job at Global Mega Corporation, you're going to be put to work on probably one project to start, perhaps maybe two, but I doubt it. But, you know, one project to start, in which case you're going to be slotting into a highly specialized task. And in particular, you may be working on one little piece of a puzzle and you may not even get to see the entire big picture. You know, you may not deal with any of the data engineering. You might just be dealing with model deployment, model fine tuning, something like that. Uh, so you'll be very, very specialized in one little piece of the pipeline. Now, of course, as your career progresses at Global Mega Corporation, you'll have the opportunity to switch roles, to move up in positions, in which case you're going to learn uh, new skill sets, new things, and you'll get the opportunity to broaden that skill base yet again, but you're still going to end up being somewhat of a specialist in a you know very niche topic. Now, perhaps the exception to this is if you rise through the ranks and become, say, a director of research or leading your own group, in which case you're going to have to have a much broader uh handle on research on the needs of the company in particular, most importantly, and how technology is going to fit into serving those needs. So you'll have to have a much broader skill set, much broader understanding of the current research, current trends, what's working, what isn't, as well as how all of these all of these things play into helping the business that you work for, Global Mega Corporation. Now let's suppose you want to do the academic research route. My hats are off to you. That is a hard and tough life. Uh, perhaps the hardest of all. So from undergrad, you're going to go uh, to graduate school where you will again be a you know, generalist with a strong specialization in one particular thing. Uh, so you will go from being totally uh, generalized to having a minor specialization in one particular topic. Now, I have a PhD in physics, not in deep learning or artificial intelligence, uh, but, you know, the situation is pretty much the same. In my case, you know, I went from being a total physics uh, generalist in undergrad to being a, uh, sorry, a total physics uh, generalist to being a specialist in uh, spin transport in magnetic nano devices. Uh, now, that is a very niche topic. It has applications in research, uh, but it is still a very niche topic and only, you know, maybe 100 to 1,000 or so order of magnitude people on the planet really know much about it, even within the broader sub, uh, subfield of physics. Your next step after graduate school will be to get a postdoc, in which case you're going to have a whole slew of uh, a whole slew of responsibilities tossed upon you, one of which will be research, and you will probably be doing something tangentially related to whatever it is you were doing as a graduate student. So you're going to take your specialization kind of to the next level and learn something in parallel to uh, whatever track you were doing and kind of really broaden your uh, research base. Hey, really quick, a word from our sponsor, my Udemy course, Deep Q Learning from Paper to Code. In this course, I will show you how to read, interpret, and implement deep reinforcement learning research papers in Pythonic PyTorch code. Uh, I'll teach you a skill set you can't really find anywhere else on Udemy as well as on YouTube, which is how to read papers. Uh, go straight to the source of the information rather than trying to go through blogception, reading blogs written based on other blogs based on other blogs where certain misunderstandings may have been propagated you don't know. Uh, go straight to the source, which are the papers, and learn how to read them. You can do that today for only $9.99. Hit the link in the description. If you're lucky enough to get a research position as a faculty member at a university, uh, then you're going to have a whole new set of challenges. You may think you've made it, but your struggles are only beginning. Uh, so you're going to have to manage a research group, uh, which means that you will have to have your finger on the pulse of research at large because you have to track down funding. you got to get money to pay students. Uh, you got to get money to get hardware or time on you know, cloud service providers, stuff like that. So you're going to have to be writing grants. You're going to have to be chasing down funding, and that requires going where the funding is. Now, funding is a funny beast where... 
uh, it's prone to bubbles. That's why we get bubbles in scientific research because of funding. Uh, funding follows projects instead of people. So uh, you end up with, instead of uh, you know funding a researcher and whatever their interests are, you end up funding particular bubbles. So uh, that's just nature of the game. That's how it's played. Uh, you know, not to complain about it, I'm just letting you, making you aware of it. But you will have to chase down funding in specific areas, which means that you're going to have to have a kind of more broad uh, experience in the field. You're going to have to know what's hot, how to parse uh, the validity and the feasibility of ideas, because only a fraction of the ideas that you may have for research are actually going to work out. And you want to balance the crazy, uh, crazy stuff that's not likely to work, but has a high potential return on investment, you know, uh, you know, novel brown, uh, groundbreaking result with things that are safer, uh, much easier to get funding for and will provide the funding you need to run your lab and get tenure as a professor. Now, let's suppose you want to go work for a startup or uh, even be a startup founder yourself. Now, you're going to need probably the most broad skill set of them all, uh, and not just in terms of artificial intelligence. I just saw an article on Towards Data Science where they said, you know, stop making uh, data scientists use Kubernetes, uh, you know, like a cloud service container type thing. And I, I'm going to have to push back on that concept. Uh, I believe that everyone should have a basic level of proficiency in DevOps. You should be able to work your way around a Linux terminal because all the servers in the world run Linux, or not all, but most of them. You know, there is Microsoft Azure, but how much that is used, I'm not certain. Uh, you will need to know your way, even in that case, around, you know, a terminal PowerShell in that case. So you'll need some basic uh, DevOps skill set. You will need some basic skill set in feature engineering, feature extraction, as well as model fine tuning and model deployment. Those are whole you know, uh, whole skill sets in and of themselves, as well as the ability to, to figure out what type of solution is going to work for which problem. You know, it's very, very costly to do these, uh, to do the feature engineering, the data gathering, the data cleaning, scrubbing, and preparation for the model, as well as training the model, fine tuning the model. That's a very, very expensive in terms of time process. And you need to have good judgment to know what type of model you're going to end up using to solve the particular problem. And that requires a relatively broad skill set. Now, at the same time, you're going to have to be a specialist in solving problems. That's your biggest specialist as a startup founder is, is solving problems. And the, uh, the key driver there is going to be your overall problem solving capability. And that is usually helped by having a broad skill set to begin with. Now, you may say, hey, Phil, I don't really want to found a startup and I don't blame you. That's a lot of work. Perhaps you just want to work for one. Well, uh, depending on at what stage you come in, you know, the same require requirements may very well apply. You'll probably end up wearing many different hats, having to fill in to help other people at many uh, various different stages of whatever, you know, problem you're working on. You know, you may end up working with the uh, the database guys to help them sort out performance issues to really decide what data is important stuff like that so you may you know end up wearing many different hats even if you were an early engineer to start up not exactly the founder now all of this is just a discussion of technical skill sets and that only scratches the surface what is you know as important if potentially more important than the uh, skill set of solving problems with code and that is a problem of dealing with people now uh, companies are going to hire you on the basis of your intelligence, your aptitude, whether or not they think they can train you to do the work that they need done. And they're going to fire you based on the fit of the company. If you do not fit into the culture, that's when you're at risk of getting fired. So the, your skill set of dealing with people is going to be a, an integral part of your toolkit uh, pretty much throughout your entire career. If you are an underling, if you're a lackey, you're going to have to be able to convince management that your ideas are good, your ideas are going to save money or generate revenue for the company because that's what it's all about, and that you are someone who brings value to the team, more value than you uh, suck up in a paycheck in particular. So that involves not just, you know, singing your own praises, but as well negotiating with others. You know, you have to, you can't be the domineering person in the room always trying to get what you want and screw everybody else. There is a give and take there. You must be able to negotiate with people because there are multiple stakeholders and resources within a company are typically finite. So if money gets diverted and resources, you know, intellectual capital gets diverted to something you think is important, it means it can't be allocated elsewhere. And so that may involve politics. You may have to navigate internal politics, you know, uh, there is always going to be a competence and power hierarchy within within an organization. You must navigate that. And whenever you move funds, resources, 
and, and manpower around, then that is going to have political implications within the organization. So you must be able to navigate bureaucracy, at least to some extent. It's not perhaps your most critical skill set, but it is something that can make or break your career. Now, one other skill set that's important, and particularly if you go to work for a global mega corporation, is your ability to work on high impact projects. This is something I faced at Intel, where there at any you know at any given time there are a hundred different things you can do to help the module, business unit, whatever. You know, there's many many different tasks, not enough time to do all of them, so you have to allocate your time and intellectual capital very very wisely amongst those because you don't want to spend time on projects that aren't going to move the needle for A, the company, and B, you at the end of the year when they do a performance review to decide whether or not to give you more money, more stock, more responsibility, uh, more rank, whatever it is that you're after. You have to be very, very careful in picking projects that are going to set you up for success long term. And this requires a little bit of a little bit of wisdom. You need to know, A, your ability to complete the project in a timely fashion with minimal help from management. It's never a good thing if you were asking management for help. I don't care what they say. Uh, you should, if you if you need to uh, ask management for help and you should do it often i mean sorry uh, early you shouldn't do it you know late in the process when the deadline's almost near and you're screwed you should do it relatively early but you need to be able to solve problems on your own otherwise if you need hand holding hey you're a liability you're going to get cut thrown overboard uh, but you need to be able to gauge your ability to solve problems independently fairly early on so you need to have an accurate assessment of your skills and that's not always easy to do. The best way to do that is through project-based learning. If you see my video on how to learn, I go more in depth on how to learn. And the general crux there is that you're going to want to rely on project-based learning to build your skill set, as well as to gain that sense of, hey, I can solve this problem, or mm, uh, it's probably too far above my level to stretch and to actually solve. So the other side of that equation is how, uh, how much is that project going to move the needle for the company and, and for this you may have to rely on the input from your manager and this is where your relationship with the manager is going to come into play uh, and if you don't have a good relationship with your manager they probably won't but some you know some individuals may attempt to sabotage but probably not because they have a vested interest in seeing you succeed as well generally because you know they get judged on the performance of their underlings and so they want their underlings to do well. Uh, very rarely will a manager directly sabotage someone beneath them, uh, but it does happen. I did see it at Intel where managers would kind of screw people over to weed them out, uh, but it was a fairly rare process, fairly rare thing. The majority of the people, it did not happen to. Another facet of a broad skill set that you will probably need uh, is that of leadership. Now, management really loves people that can uh, take ownership of problems and see them through all the way to completion. Uh, and the reason is that these types of people, uh, you know, if you're a type A person that's going to take ownership of problems, then you're going to provide more value to the company than you extract in a paycheck. And so they like that because, hey, if everybody did that, then well, they might have more internal clashes of personality, but at least they would get more value per employee. So they love that. But taking ownership over problems is going to be a really big key in your success. And this is a, you know, totally a soft skill, not something related to your skill set of can you write code. It's something related to your mindset as an employee. Now, some employees have the mindset that, you know, if it's not in their job description, they don't do it. These people don't tend to last very long in high performance organizations. And the reason is that they're getting paid about the same amount of money as the person who takes ownership over multiple problems and tries to, you know, uh, extend their reach into other modules, other groups, other projects to gain influence within the company. And so that person provides far more value per dollar spent on their salary. And so the company prefers to keep that person over the one that says, hey, that's not in my job description. I'm not gonna do it. So related to that, it, the concept of ownership is taking ownership over leading your team. Now, just because you're not a manager doesn't mean you can't be a leader. There's a difference between a manager and a leader. You know, there's a, some you know, picture floating around of a manager standing in the back whipping the people and the leader out front pulling the load with the people. And it's kind of trite, but you know, there is a certain amount of truth to it. A manager will attempt to manage typically through, you know, the carrot and stick approach. Hey, if you do well, you get more money. If you do poorly, you get fired. Uh, but a leader uh, leads by example. They inspire others to action based on uh, their positive role modeling of the corporate values. And so what this looks like in practice is not complaining in meetings. Uh, you can point out reasonable objections and things, uh, technical issues you see with a plan and, you know, say, hey, this may be a problem. What is our solution to this? 
Uh, but you can't complain and they say and say, oh, that's stupid. It's never going to work. Never do that. Uh, nobody likes to be around negative people, even in, you know, even in your daily life, you probably don't want to hang out with negative people. And that's especially true at work because you're spending a significant amount of your waking hours at work. And so nobody wants to be around a stick in the mud. So don't be a stick in the mud. Even if you think something isn't going to work, you need to phrase it in such a way that expresses your belief that it can work and the attitude of how we're going to solve the problems to make it work. And this goes to helping other people. Now, you don't want to do the work for other people uh, because that ends up screwing them in the end. Uh, you know, everybody's job is assigned to them specifically and they need to be able to complete it themselves. Uh, but uh, giving help to other people, giving advice, showing leadership and mentorship within the team is an asset to the company. And this goes, you know, across uh, whatever your career aspirations are, uh, having leadership is going to serve you well. Even if you don't intend to be a manager, it's going to help you ascend the ranks of the technical path in whatever organization you're in to be a you know a top tier individual contributor. So that wraps up my thoughts around specialization versus generalization in AI and deep learning. I know there's a bit of a bait and switch in there, and that's because uh, you know I want to get views because what I have to say is important and. If you notice, I left the most important material for the end because the soft skill sets really are going to set you up for success in the future. It's almost a certainty if you're watching this video, if you're in the sound of my voice, uh, that you are a competent technical person. You can solve technical problems. And so that's really, you know, not in dispute. Uh, but you may have neglected those soft skills, those interpersonal skills, and those are really what's going to set you up for long-term success as an engineer. Because, you know, there's a stereotype of the antisocial engineer, and it's true to a certain extent, but the reality is that most of the people I met at Intel who'd been there for a very long time were quite sociable, quite uh, amicable people who knew how to navigate human interactions. And, that, you know, that's not a, a coincidence, and that was by design of the system. So, you know, take my experience for whatever it's worth. Hopefully it jives with your experience. Uh, just to recap, uh, if you want to be a startup founder, you need the most broad skill set possible. You're going to need to know DevOps. You're going to need to know how to solve problems, how to scrub data, how to pre-process data, how to train a model, how to, you know, uh, fine tune a model as well as how to deploy a model into production as well as how to manage other teams of say web developers, backend developers for the database, because maybe you don't know that specifically, but you do know something about it and thus can manage people. But Hey, that's more, you know, soft skill sets you're going to need. Versus if you're going to work for a global mega corporation, you're going to need to be relatively uh, generalized to get in the door to pass the interview process and then quite specialized to exceed at your role. And then if you're going to be a faculty member, you're going to need probably a very broad skill set to be able to uh, write grants. That's something I didn't even really talk about too much, but you do need to be able to write and to be able to string together multiple words in a way that is persuasive to other people because, hey, you need their money. And you're going to need to know uh, what is the state of research, what is the pulse, uh, how can you get funding for certain things, and how can you position your lab to be successful in the future. And as always, you're going to need soft skills. You're going to need to know how to deal with people, how to talk to people, how to negotiate with people in particular. That is going to hold true in every organization and every job you have, and the importance of which cannot be understated. I hope that was helpful. If it is, leave a like, a subscribe, and make sure to hit the bell icon so you get notified when I release a new video. And I'll see you in that next video.